Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. And it's six o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started for the evening. I hope everyone is doing well and welcome to week number four for PPA 500. Uh, before we get going, just a couple of reminders. Uh, for those of you who've already submitted Canvas essay number three in your responses, thank you for that. I've been grading them as they come in, reading them and evaluating them. So, uh, but do remember if you haven't done it yet, you have until Sunday at midnight, March 26th to submit your response along with responses to two of your classmates. Then also on Sunday, March 26th by midnight, you'll also be turning in your midterm assessment as well. And so we've got those two assignments that are due uh, by midnight on March 26th. Then March 27th begins our one week spring break. Uh, even though we are a distance learning program, we still adhere to the same schedule as our on-campus colleagues. And so we need to observe spring break just like our on-campus colleagues do. So we will not have class next Monday on the 27th as, as part of spring break. So the next time we will have a Zoom session together will be two weeks from tonight which is April 3rd. And I believe I've already mentioned to you last week that on April 3rd, I will be at a conference and presenting a paper at the National Social Science Association annual meeting. And so my panel is scheduled to go until 545 on that evening. So after giving it some thought, I think in order to be sure that I'll be able to be back and get the class set up and get everything started, that we can start that April 3rd session at 7 p.m. as opposed to 6 p.m. And that should give me ample time to get back from the conference venue and get everything set up and get class ready to go. I will send a reminder email out as we get closer to the date. But again, two weeks from tonight, we will start that session at 7 p.m. as opposed to 6 p.m. And then again, next week on the 27th, we do not have a Zoom session schedule for spring break. So. Just a couple of reminders about where we are. Uh, this is technically our fourth out of six weeks. And so we are quickly speeding toward the finish line of PPA 500. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to cover the information, the remaining information that you need in order to complete your midterm assessment. And so I'll provide you with the information that you need on these theoretical perspectives on public administration that will allow you then to successfully address scenario number five on the midterm assessment. So up to this point, we've presented all the information that you need for scenarios one through four. You'll get the information for scenario five tonight. And I'm not gonna move on into new information after that, because again, we've got spring break coming. So this is a real nice breaking point in the class. Just go through theoretical perspectives this evening. I do have a breakout group exercise. I think we'll probably have time to do. Uh, in fact, I'm sure we'll have time to do it tonight. Uh, and then maybe we'll have a little bit of an early evening because I, I'm kind of loathe to go into new information that will be on the final and before we, we have our spring break. So tonight we're gonna cover the theoretical perspectives on public administration. Then we'll have next week off. And then on April 3rd, we'll get into some more of the functions of public administration. We'll talk about the role that administrators play in policy analysis. We'll go through the three different phases of policy, policy formulation, policy implementation, and policy execution, and highlight the different roles that public administrators play in all three of those different phases. We'll talk about decision-making models and uh, you know, ways in which we make decisions in public policy. Uh, we'll then also talk about the roles of public administrators in the evaluation of public programs, uh, which is essentially information that you'll be covering then in your 696 research methods course. And then we'll wrap up the show on April 3rd by talking about some different models of organizational effectiveness, ways in which we can measure effectiveness in the public sector. Then for our last Monday session on April 10th, we'll continue the discussion of some of the functions that we engage in as public administrators. We will talk about managing human resources and the different areas of public employment. And then we'll talk about the different functions involved in the management of human resources. If time permits on the 10th, we'll then also get into a discussion of the management of fiscal resources. We'll talk about different types of budgets. We'll talk about how we manage budgets. We'll talk about fund-based accounting and some of the basic principles in the management of those fiscal resources. Uh, we may or may not have time to cover all the rest of that information on April 10th. I think we probably will, uh, but if we don't, then whatever we don't 
finish up on the 10th. We'll finish up on our Saturday session on the 15th. If we get through all of our information on April the 10th and we don't have any information left that we need to cover, uh, then we may end up making that last uh, Saturday session on the 15th optional. But we'll, we'll kind of see how we progress as we cover the material. So that's where we are now, where we are going over our next few weeks together. That'll then wrap up your 500 course. Uh, we'll wrap it up then on April the 15th. And then you'll be ready to move ahead to your second course in the program, which is PPA 555 Public Budgeting and Finance with Dr. Scott Williams. And uh, he's been teaching the program, uh, this course in the program now, I believe this is his fourth cohort. I think he's taught for us at least three, maybe four. Uh, and I think that's a course that you'll really enjoy. He has a great deal of practical experience as a finance director and also has his doctorate in public administration. So he does a really nice job of blending together the practice along with the theory. And so that'll be your next class, the public budgeting and finance course uh, is where you're moving then after we're done with 500. Okay, um, any questions before we get into our information for this evening? Okay, and seeing none then, let me kind of preface some of the information we're covering tonight. And, you know, I always tell, you, tell all my courses, and I've told you this as well, that I have a favorite question, which is so what, and I have a favorite answer, which is it depends. So the so what of covering these theoretical perspectives, why, why are we spending an evening talking about the development of theoretical perspectives in the study of public administration? One of the main reasons why we do devote time to this is obviously this is information that you will need when you get to your PPA 660 organization theory course, uh, which you will have with me. That's not coming up for quite a while, but that's a course that we will have together again. And so this kind of foreshadows some of those theories that we'll talk about in much more detail once we get to PPA 660. Uh, another reason why we talk about this information is it helps to flesh out this discussion that we began last week about public administration as a discipline. And I said I was going to leave it up to you to form your own opinion about whether or not you believe public administration is a discipline. You have an opportunity to do that on the midterm assessment, and then you'll again have an opportunity to then share your opinions uh, with your classmates once we get to Canvas essay number four. But when we talk about public administration as a discipline, one of the things that makes something an academic discipline is really its uniqueness. The more unique it is in terms of what we are studying and the methods we're using to study that phenomenon, the more likely it is to be a standalone separate academic discipline. So as we go through our discussion of theoretical perspectives, we're gonna talk about how we study public organizations and how we study public organizations, how that has changed and evolved and developed over the past 150 years. So as we go through all this, and we talk about these different schools of thought and these different theories and theorists, think about how unique some of these theories are. And if these theories you believe are unique enough to qualify public administration as an academic discipline. So we're kind of continuing that thread of discussion that we had last week about public administration as a discipline. Then with my favorite answer of it depends, one of the things that really ties our entire discussion together tonight is a movement away from looking for the one size fits all approach to creating effective organizations and a movement more toward the it depends answer, movement more toward to the situational contextual answer the question of how can we make public administration and our public organizations more effective. Now, again, if we are an academic discipline, we are going to have the development of theories, um, ideas about how the world works, and then different methods that we can use in order to measure those theories, to see how accurate those theories are. If we are truly an academic discipline, then we are going to take somewhat unique approaches to studying those different phenomena and to studying that unique topic that we are studying in public administration. So way back near the beginning of the class, we tried to attach a, a definition to public administration. And we said, when we talked about public administration, we're talking about the study of public bureaucracies. And we then drilled down a little bit more and said, well, what's a public bureaucracy? And we said, a public bureaucracy is a public organization. 
So at its very heart, a lot of the theories that we have developed over the past 150 years in the study of public administration have been theories that are geared toward making our organizations more effective. And so our focus of a lot of our public administration theories is a focus on public organizations. And that's why there's a lot of overlap between what we talk about tonight with these theoretical perspectives on administration and then some of those discrete organization theories and theorists that you'll discuss when we get together then again in PPA 660 organization theory. I think the best way, or I shouldn't say the best, I should, the most appropriate way to keep with our theme of the class, the most appropriate way to talk about these theoretical approaches to studying public organizations is to deal with them chronologically. Because when we deal with them chronologically, we can see how these theories have morphed and how they've changed over the years. I remember we talked about one characteristic of public administration is that public administration, the study of public administration is timeless, yet it is time bound, that it's floating in the seas of time, meaning that the way in which we study our organizations will be contingent upon the era in which we are studying those organizations. So the theories we develop in the late 1800s and the early 1900s are probably gonna look a lot different than the theories we develop in the 1990s and the 2000s because of our different understanding of human nature and our different understanding and value that we are placing upon human beings as the employees within these public organizations. So the way in which I like to organize it is chronologically, but then also to organize it according to different schools of thought. So to group authors and to group theories together that share many of the same characteristics within their own schools of thought. So we're gonna talk about several different discrete schools of thought that have developed over the past 150 years. And we'll talk about why new schools develop because most new schools of thought develop as a rejoinder or a response to the school of thought that occurred before them. So the classical uh, school of thought is one of the first schools of thought we'll talk about, but then we'll move on talking to uh, we'll talk about some neoclassical schools of thought. Those neoclassical schools of thought developed as rejoinders, as responses to some of the perceived flaws within the classical school. So we're gonna organize our discussion by schools of thought. So let's start with our first school of thought and that's the classical school of organization theory. And this is, will be a group of authors who shared some similarities, had some differences as well, but share some, some similarities in the way in which they viewed organizations and as well as the purpose of why they were developing these theories. So when we deal with the classical school of organization theory, the three individuals we usually talk about, Max Weber, Frederick Taylor, and Luther Gullick. Max Weber's on the left-hand side there at the bottom, Frederick Taylor in the middle at the top, and Luther Gullick on the right-hand side. And those are three of the main theorists that really characterize this classical school of organization theory. Now, when you get to organization theory, the PPA 660 course, we're gonna put more flesh on the bones and we'll talk about some other of those classical theorists in this school of thought. But again, just for our limited purposes here in 500, those are the three individuals that we are going to focus on. And as I discuss each one of these three individuals and the theories that they develop, we are gonna look at the commonalities that bind them together within this classical school, but we'll also highlight some of the differences in the areas of focus in their theories because they don't all completely overlap upon each other, but they do share some similar types of goals. These three individuals in the classical school, what makes them classical in nature is that they all share what we refer to as a macro level approach in that they are all focusing upon the organization as an institution. Their goal is to make the organization effective and efficient. So they're not really focused on the individual employee, they're focused on the organization, the organization's goals and objectives and trying to find ways to make organizations more effective and more efficient. And that's one thread that ties these three individuals together in this classical school. Another thread that ties them together into this classical school is the search for the one-size-fits-all approach. 
classical theorists felt that they could develop this magic bullet. And this magic bullet is this panacea, this one size fits all cure all that could then be applied to all organizations to make those organizations effective and efficient. Now today we know there is no one size fits all approach. We know very well today that it really depends upon the context of the situation. But for classical theorists, they really felt they could develop theories that could be applied uh, universally in all situations for all organizations to make those organizations efficient and effective. So let's start out with where we always tend to start with the classical school, and that's our good friend, Max Weber. And Max Weber was a German sociologist. And so he brought sociological approaches into his study of bureaucracies. Weber believed that a bureaucracy was the highest form of rationality. He believed that we should make our decisions based upon empirical evidence as opposed to making our decisions based upon faith or belief. So he, well, he thought that if we're going to make a decision and we're going to choose a course of action, that choice should be informed with the collection and the analysis of empirical data. And by empirical data, we mean data, information that we can sense. It's tangible type of information. We collect the information, we analyze it, we then use that in order to make decisions. And he felt that a bureaucratic organization was the perfect vehicle for that type of rationality. He viewed organizations as being formal and rational in nature. And as a formal, rational type of entity, organizations could be effective if they fit what he considered to be his ideal type of bureaucratic structure. An ideal bureaucracy, according to Max Weber, is a bureaucracy, an organization that exhibits the following characteristics. And you've probably heard of these before, and you probably experienced them in your organization today, a tall hierarchy, whereby we have this pyramidal shape to our organizational structure. We have a singular head, a singular leader, director, uh, whatever that position may be at the apex of that pyramid. Then as you go down the organization structure, you encounter more and more positions so that when you get to the bottom of your pyramid, you get to this bottom level of the pyramid, that's where the majority of your positions are going to reside. So as you move down your organization structure, you'll encounter more and more positions. That is a tall hierarchy. Within that type of a tall hierarchical structure, we can then divide up the labor. We can divide up the work. So everyone's not working on the exact same job. We're going to take the work of the organization, divide it up among all the different members of the organization. Once you divide up the labor, then you have individual employees that are specializing in certain types of tasks. So this person will specialize in construction of budgets. This person will specialize in the onboarding of employees. This person will specialize on, in planning, you know, strategic planning process for the organization. Everyone specializes in their own tasks. When you have people specializing in their own specific tasks on a daily basis, doing the same jobs day in and day out, those individuals then become experts on those jobs. So we have an organization that is then staffed by these experts. They know their jobs very well because they're doing them on a daily basis. In this hall hierarchy, we also have a principle known as unity of command, meaning that everyone knows to whom they are accountable in the organization chart. So everyone has a manager, everyone has a supervisor, uh, and every and then that in that unity of the command, then all that. Uh, reporting mechanism, all those reporting mechanisms then feed all the way back up then to the person at the apex at the top of the organization. All of those supervisors and managers will then have a limited span of control, meaning that they will only be responsible for a limited number of employees. So you won't be directly responsible to everyone in the organization chart below you. You may only be responsible for people who work within your unit or within your division. So you may only be responsible for five people or seven people or 10 people, but you're not responsible for everyone who is below you. You have a limited number of what we call direct reports within that organizational chart. 
And again, you can see how this is rational because everyone has a job, everyone knows their job. We have a structure, everyone knows to whom they are responsible. Um, every supervisor knows who they are being held responsible for the, for the actions for. You've got a very rational type of organization that develops this type of empirical information. These experts then that staff your organizations, they are professionals. They have the requisite skills, the knowledge, skills, and abilities in order to do the jobs effectively and efficiently. And they are there for a career. They view their service in this organization as a career. They're not looking to bounce around different organizations. They are in this organization for their entire professional career. And we base our decisions upon written documentation. So we have things like our organization chart. We have things like our policy and procedure manual. We have our code of ethics and our code of conduct, all of our rules and regulations that will govern how we are doing our jobs on a daily basis. And all of that gets written down into written documentation. The advantage of having written documentation is obviously you can then treat people equally. So you can say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat this citizen in this way because this is what the rules say. I'm gonna treat another citizen in the exact same way because the exact same rules apply to that individual. The downside obviously, as we know of written documentation is sometimes you get too much written documentation. Too much written documentation leads to a mountain of red tape. The more red tape we have in our organizations, the less likely it is that we will be efficient and effective at doing our jobs. We can see the thrust of Weber's theories here is that if we could create all the organizations in this ideal structure, then we can ensure that our organizations will be efficient and effective. So he's looking at the efficiency and effectiveness at the micro level of the organization as a whole, and then getting to that point of being efficient and effective through the structuring of the organization, by structuring the organization in this very um, formal, very regimented type of way. And that's what Weber considered to be an ideal bureaucracy. Now, Weber was writing primarily in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. I believe he, I believe he passed away in like 1921, if I'm not mistaken. So he was writing in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And he felt that this was this one size fits all, this silver bullet that could then be applied to all organizations in order to make those organizations efficient and effective. Then a second author that we talked about in this classical school is our good friend, Frederick Taylor. And if you've had undergraduate public administration, you run into Frederick Taylor before. If you had undergraduate business organization courses, I'm sure you've covered Frederick Taylor. Frederick Taylor develops his theories in the world of the private sector. He was a management analyst and then brings those theories from the private sector and applies them to the public sector. So Max Weber is coming from a sociological perspective. Frederick Taylor is coming from more of a business type of orientation. Frederick Taylor's purpose was to try and enhance the efficiency of the organization. And Frederick Taylor was primarily writing in the early 1900s. Uh, his most famous theory known as scientific management really hit its heyday in the 1920s. And what Taylor was looking at when he looked at organizations in the early 1900s is he was looking, he was looking at organizations that had a lot of labor strife. You know, you think about books like, you know, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. And we had our workplaces were relatively dangerous places to work. Uh, they were not the most pleasant places to work. You had a lot of labor unrest in a lot of our organizations. And that labor unrest was leading to a lot of inefficiencies within those organizations as well. So what Taylor wanted to do is Taylor wanted to kind of bridge the gap between upper level management and your everyday line workers. We didn't really have middle managers at that point in time. So Taylor thought if we could train and uh, implement this middle management system, then you would be able to bridge this gap between the top of the organization chart and the bottom of the organization chart. Taylor's theories were very much predicated on a very poor view of human beings. 
He uh, various times in his writings referred to employees as being boorish beasts. He called them cogs in the machinery of the organization. And when you think about uh, the machinery of an organization, you're looking at a machine and you have all these different cogs and the cogs all have teeth on them. And so as the teeth will, from one cog push on the teeth of another cog, that's what then turns the cogs. If a tooth breaks off of one of the cogs, there's nothing to push against and the machinery will grind to a halt. If people are cogs, then if you have a broken cog, a broken person in the organization, you take that person out you throw them away just like you would throw a cog away. You then replace them with a cog that has all its teeth so that that machinery will then start operating again. Let's see, Esmeralda, last question. Did Taylor overall want to close the gap between the top and the bottom of the organization by creating a middleman? Exactly, yeah, that's what he wanted to do. Is he thought if we could create this level of, of uh, middle management and this level of middle management could then take direction from the upper level of the organization and then pass that direction along directly through direct supervision of the employees who are doing the job on a daily basis. And so, yes, this is where this middle management type of idea comes from in a lot of our modern day organization. So what Taylor wanted to do is he wanted to take each job in the organization. His focus was more on the job as compared to Baber who his entire focus is on structure. Now with Taylor, his focus was more on the job itself. If we could take each individual job, deconstruct each job into its component elements, we could then find the uh, best way of doing each job in our organization, basically the most efficient way of doing each job in our organization. And that's what led him to his theory known as scientific management, and the approach he used to measure jobs within scientific management was this thing known as a time motion study. So he would literally do like a, a productivity study where you know you stand behind the employee with a stopwatch. You would then time every single movement that employee took in doing the job. And so a very rudimentary example of a time motion study was looking at the shoveling of pig oil. A very simple job, but a very labor intensive job. And so you had employees who were shoveling pig ore. They were shoveling pig ore from this pile of pig ore and putting this uh, shovel pulls of pig ore into a cart. So he would literally time how long did it take them to pick up the shovel, to put the shovel into the pile of pig ore, to lift the shovel full of pig ore out, to then take the shovel full of pig ore over to the cart, to then dump the shovel full into the cart, to then return and go back to the pile and start the process over again. He would time every single movement that that employee took in shoveling pig ore. And the idea was you could then take all of the efficient movements, you can combine them all together into the one best way to do the job. All inefficient movements he referred to as false movements. So if there's a movement that was inefficient. So for instance, if we had a, an employee who had to take two or three steps to get to the cart, that would be a false movement because you could just move the cart closer to the pile and you could eliminate those two or three steps. So we eliminate taking those two or three steps, eliminate those false movements, and we then make the job much more efficient. And so you collect all the efficient movements together and all the collection of all those efficient movements then becomes what he called the one best way to do the job. So through those types of time motion studies, he was able to identify the one best way to do the job for all of our jobs in our organization. We then hire people based upon having the skills to do the job in that one best way. We then train them in how to do the job in the one best way. We then also make sure we train our middle managers so that our middle managers can then watch our employees, supervise them, and hold them accountable for doing the job in that one best way. Then if the employee is not doing the job in the one best way, then you get rid of that employee and replace them with a new employee, train that new employee to do the job in the one best way. And that's kind of this idea of scientific management. And that's how you make your organization efficient by focusing on the jobs that are being done and finding the most efficient way of doing all those jobs within your organization. Now, obviously the big downside of Frederick Taylor 
was that it was a very dehumanizing approach to human beings. If you're calling people boorish beasts and you're viewing them as just being simply cogs in the machinery of the organization, you are not recognizing the inherent value that they have as human beings. You are not motivating them by trying to appeal to their, their um, higher desires and to their desires for growth. He did talk about compensation. And so Taylor did talk a lot about pay for performance. So if you get an employee, you then train them, and then they are doing this job consistently in that one best way, they then should be compensated. They should be rewarded for doing the job in the one best way that they've been directed to do the job. So he's a big believer in compensation for employees, as well as compensation for middle managers if their employees were being efficient. But again, it, was, it didn't really go beyond that compensation. We really weren't looking at what the wants, needs, and desires beyond monetary needs of our individual employees. But despite those criticisms of scientific management, scientific management, again, really hit its heyday in the 1920s, so much so that a lot of these principles of scientific management were taken from private organizations and then applied broad scale across the federal bureaucracy and across public organizations. There are a lot of vestiges that are still left over from Taylor and scientific management, even in our modern day organizations. The idea of having job descriptions, doing job analysis and job evaluations, which result in job descriptions. Those are all things that grew directly out of scientific management. Taking those job descriptions, conducting that job evaluation and creating a position classification system, whereby we can then compensate people equal amounts of money for equal work, those position classification systems also grew out of this idea of scientific management. So if your organization has a position classification system, which I can guarantee the vast majority of public organizations have, if you have a position description, you know, that position description was created through the conducting of a job analysis and the use of a job evaluation that we will talk about later on when we talk about managing human resources, if you've got all those things going on in your organization, you can thank scientific management for having all those innovations. So even in our modern day organizations, we still use aspects of scientific management. But again, the big downside is that it overlooked the human aspect and the social aspect of organizations. They viewed employees as just being replaceable. And the primary goal was again, the efficiency of the organization as opposed to the well being of the individual employee. But what ties Taylor and Weber together, they're both focusing on the benefits of the organization. They're both focusing on the efficiency or effectiveness of the organization itself, as opposed to focusing on individual employees. The difference is Weber looked more at structure, whereas Taylor looked a lot more at work processes. And then the third author that we introduced in this class that is part of the classical school of organization theory is this gentleman by the name of Luther Gullick. Luther Gullick is different from Weber and Taylor in that Gullick was actually able to take his theories and put them directly into public organizations. So if you're looking at connection to public administration, Luther Gullick had a much stronger connection to public administration than either Max Weber, who was a sociologist, or Frederick Taylor, who was more of a business management efficiency type of consultant. Luther Gullick now actually has a direct connection to public administration, and that direct connection comes primarily from his service on this thing called the Brownlow Commission. And the Brownlow Commission was a commission, put in text chat, in the 1930s that was designed to try and overhaul the federal bureaucracy uh, during the FDR administration. So FDR comes in as president, he wins the election in 1932, he's inaugurated in 1933. When he comes in office in 1933, the country is in the throes of the Great Depression. And so FDR decides in order to help pull state and local governments out of the Great Depression and to stimulate the economy, he would do it through, as we all know, his New Deal. And the New Deal consisted of the creation of all these different agencies and all these different programs. And oftentimes referred to the agencies as the alphabet agencies. 
as agencies were created that went by their um, their their three letter uh, designation, you know, Social Security Administration, things such as that. So we create all these alphabet agencies and greatly expand the size of the federal bureaucracy. In doing so, we made it much more difficult for the president as chief executive to oversee all these different elements, all these agencies and programs within the federal bureaucracy. So the job of the Brownlow Commission was to essentially overhaul the federal bureaucracy to make it easier for the president to manage and to make the federal bureaucracy more effective and more efficient with all these new programs and all these new agencies. So the Brownlow Commission essentially consisted of three members, three different commissioners, Lewis Brownlow, Charles Merriam, and then here our good friend, Luther Gullick. Those three individuals then put together their reorganization report, uh, delivered it to the president, and then eventually led to some major changes to the federal government and the way in which we do federal bureaucracy. One of the major recommendations of the Brownlow Commission was to hire people, almost everyone in the bureaucracy based upon merit. Now, hiring people based upon merit started with the Pendleton Act back in 1883, but was greatly expanded as a result of some of the recommendations from the Brownlow Commission. The Brownlow Commission also recommended more of a focus on performance, training our public managers, and then holding them accountable for not only their performance, but for the performance of their organization. So we started to get some performance measurement, performance management that grows out of this Brownlow Commission report. So the greatest contribution that Luther Gullick made to our understanding of public organizations was the develop of this thing that came to be known as the principles approach to organizations or the principal school. In this principal school, Gullick says that there are certain management functions that are done by all organizations. So a la what we read in the Graham Allison article, where Graham Allison talks about the similarities between public and private organization revolve around these generic management functions. Well, here are those generic management functions that Allison talked about. Went by the acronym of POSCOR, stood for planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. All managers, in order to make their organizations effective and efficient, they all must engage in these different types of functions. They all must strategically plan the operations of their organization. They all must organize all the different elements of the organization. You must staff, bring in people who have the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities to do the job based upon merit uh, as a result of the Brownlow Commission. Uh, you had to direct them in how to do their jobs, very much like a Frederick Taylor in scientific management. You have to coordinate all the disparate elements of your organization to help achieve your organization goals and objectives. You have to have a reporting mechanism so that you can report on how well you are achieving your goals and objectives and what all the different units and divisions and departments of the organization are doing. And money is the lifeblood of an organization. So we engage in budgeting. We have to bring money into the organization and we have to efficiently and legally manage that money in order to accomplish our goals and our objectives. Gullick really viewed these different principles as being a toolkit that could be taught and given to managers. And if we provide this toolkit to our managers, they will then know when they should be planning, when they should be organizing, when they should be coordinating and how to do each of those generic management functions. And it doesn't matter what organization it is. It doesn't matter if it's private or public. It doesn't matter if it's big or if it's small. It doesn't matter if it's direct administration or indirect administration. These different tools are used by managers in every single organization. So if we can provide them with this toolkit, teach them how to use the tools in this toolkit, that's how we make efficient and effective organizations. So you can see Gullick shares with Weber and Taylor this attempt to try and find the one size fits all approach. For Weber is the one structure, for Taylor it was the one best way to do the job, for Gullick it was this one set of tools, this one set of principles that we can teach our managers how to use in order to make our organizations efficient and effective. Another thing that they shared was the focus on the macro. 
because the ultimate goal when you're favor of your structure is to make the organization effective and efficient. Your ultimate goal of coming up with the one best way to do the job with tailored and scientific management is to make the organization efficient. Your ultimate goal with teaching these principles and providing this toolkit to your managers is to make the organization effective and efficient. So the ultimate goal is still that macro level goal. It's just the way in which they went about achieving that macro level goal differ somewhat between Weber, Taylor, and Gullick. But Gullick, again, the Brownlow Commission was in the 1930s, and that's where his theories of the principal school really started to hit their heyday in the 1930s and then continue on into the 1940s. Not everyone was enamored with the principal school, and we had some big heavy hitters, if you will, in public administration who had some major uh, reservations about this principal school. People such as Herb Simon and Dwight Waldo. And you'll run into Herb Simon and Dwight Waldo many different times in this MPA program. We will talk about them again in organization theory. Um, Herb Simon, I sometimes talk about when I teach budgeting as well. But Herb Simon and Dwight Waldo had concerns about this principal school and they thought it was too easy. So it's too easy to say, here are these principles, teach your managers these principles, and then they will be efficient and make the organization efficient and effective. Simon and Waldo both said that these principles are a lot more like what they refer to as proverbs. They said proverbs can, you can always find one proverb that can contradict another proverb. And they said it's the same type of thing with these principles. You can always find one principle to contradict another principle. That when you're focusing all your effort on staffing, you will probably end up losing sight of planning. When you're focusing all your time on budgeting, you may lose focus on coordination. And that there are oftentimes we can't do them all at once because they're almost mutually exclusive in terms of the amount of resources we have to put into these different types of activities. So when they referred to them as proverbs, they were doing it in a very pejorative, a very uh, derisive manner. And they felt, uh, had very poor vision, very poor view of uh, this principles type of school. Not only did they view the principles uh, as being proverbs and were very dubious about these principles, they also felt that there wasn't a whole lot of science to back up these principles. And there wasn't a whole lot of research that went into establishing that, yes, indeed, these principles of planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting, those make up this universal toolkit for all managers. That there really wasn't enough empirical evidence that backed up the principal school. So not everyone was enamored with it. But Luther Gullick, probably of the three, Weber, Taylor, and Gullick, Gullick really had the most direct impact upon the public sector through his work on the Brownlow Commission and bringing this principal school directly in to the federal bureaucracy. So that's what we refer to as the, the classical school of organization theory. And again, when you get into 660, you'll also talk about other people such as um, Henri Fayol, They'll talk about Mooney, and we'll, we'll introduce some other theorists within that classical school. But for our purposes here in 500, those are the three authors that really characterize this, this classical school and really um, gave this classical school its flavor in terms of the focus of the classical school and the kind of dehumanizing way in which they viewed uh, individual employees. Now, as we begin to move into the night through the 1920s into the 1930s, we had a few people who started to stand up and really take issue with the classical approach and its dehumanizing approach to um, how we viewed human beings. And that gave rise to the creation of new schools of thought that were all generated as rejoinders to the criticisms associated with the classical school. So these schools all together have been known as what are called the neoclassical schools. They came after the classical school, the, the newer approaches, they're called the neoclassical schools. So for instance, on the midterm assessment where I'm asking you to talk about two neoclassical theorists, I'm talking about theorists from schools such as the human relations school, the human resources management school, the system school, 
and some more modern schools such as organization culture, quality management, and leadership theories. So these were these newer approaches. They really contradicted a lot of the premises that the classical school was built upon, we refer to as our neoclassical theories. So let's go through those different schools of thought. We're going to focus primarily on the human relations school, the human resource management school, the system school, and then organization culture school as our neoclassical theories we're going to use as examples here in 500. So let's start with the human relations school. Now, in the 1920s, again, that is when scientific management was really hitting its heyday. That's when in the private sector, scientific management was being adopted across the board by private organizations and beginning to then seep into our public organizations as well. When people were buying in pretty much lock, stock and barrel into this idea of scientific management, we did have somebody by the name of Mary Parker Follett who really took issue with scientific management. And Mary Parker Follett, along with another female author, Lillian Gilbreth, really did take a lot of issue with the way in which scientific management was dealing with individual employees. And they really felt that more attention needed to be paid to how we relate with human beings within our organizations. Uh, when we get to 660, you'll talk more about Lillian Gilbreth, but for our purposes tonight, we're gonna to focus primarily on Mary Parker Follett. Mary Parker Fall is one of my favorite authors, not just because she focused on the idea of democracy, but also because she was kind of one of the lone voices in the wilderness, was willing to stand up and take issue with scientific management when everyone else was buying into it. And I really, I really do appreciate that kind of pioneering approach that Mary Parker Fall had in moving us away from the classical school in scientific management and moving us toward a more human type of focus in our organizations. Now, obviously the problem for Mary Parker Follett is she was writing in the 1920s. In the 1920s, writing as a female scholar, obviously a lot of your male colleagues um, overlooked your writing and didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And unfortunately for Mary Parker Follett, she didn't get a lot of the due that she um, should have gotten in the 1920s she didn't really get a lot of that respect and a lot of that admiration until later on after her career was, was essentially over. But Mary Parker Paul was willing to stand up and take issue with scientific management. And the big issue again she took with scientific management was it's the humanizing approach to individual employees. Mary Parker Fall made an interesting argument about organizations. She said, we should view our organizations as democratic institutions that if we can manage and we can run our organizations as democracies, we can then be much more effective and much more efficient as an organization. She said, if we're gonna look at our organizations as democracies, we need to recognize that there are some inherent flaws that are built into a democratic system of governance. I don't wanna to get too political sciencey on you in this class, but uh, there are some flaws in a democracy. One of the flaws of a democracy, according to Follett, is the passivity of its citizens. That in theory, in a democracy, power comes from the people. And we all know in our system of democracy, as we talked about uh, at the beginning of this class, uh, beginning of this semester together, uh, we base our system of government on this idea of a social contract, a constitution. And that social contract is that contract between the people and their government, whereby people give up some of their rights and liberties to government, and then government agrees to utilize those rights and liberties in a judicious way. But the check on how government is utilizing rights and liberties comes from the people, and people can participate in their own governance. We know in our, here in California, we have a lot of different ways in which we can participate in our own governance. We can vote, we can start initiative petitions to get something on the ballot, uh, we can run for office, we can support candidates financially, we could join interest groups and we can lobby the state legislature or lobby Congress, um, give money to candidates. There are all kinds of avenues for our participation. Fallon argues that typically in a democracy, despite all those avenues for participation, the avenue that 
citizens usually select is the one that imposes the least burden. And that's gonna be the most passive one that's probably gonna be voting. And here in California, voting can be a very passive type of activity, especially compared to other states. Because of a change in state law, we now as voters in California, everyone in California, every voter receives a, an absentee ballot, a mail-in ballot. And so you don't even have to go to the voting booth anymore in order to vote. You can just vote uh, from home with your, uh, your mail-in ballot. So it tends to be a very passive way of participating in governance. And democracies kind of breed that passivity on the part of their citizens. A second problem with a democracy is just what James Masson talked about and you wrote about in your Canvas essay, the whole idea of factions, these particularized interests that when you have a compound republic, the way in which we have a compound republic, conflict is inevitable. And you're going to have groups that come into conflict with each other. These groups, these factions have particularized interests. Follett says, because of that, you're going to have a lot of conflict. Conflict is an inherent part or an outgrowth of a democratic system of government. So she said, if we're going to treat our organizations as democracies, we're gonna to have to deal with these two flaws, the passivity of our members of our organization, as well as the conflict that naturally will occur from these particularized interests coming into conflict with each other. So she says, how we deal with passivity of our employees is we deal with it through trying to enhance their participation. We deal with it by getting them involved in making decisions, turning decisions over to our employees, delegating these decisions to our employees, helping our employees build their own power bases. She was very famous uh, for saying that uh, power is a resource not to be given, but rather it's a resource to be developed. And that we as managers and leaders in our organizations have the responsibility to help develop our human uh, employees as resources and help them develop their own power. Uh, it's what you refer to as a power with, as opposed to a power over type of an arrangement. And the only way we can do that is through a system of communication and enhancing opportunities for our employees to participate in their own self-governance. And through, so through communication, through participation, that's how we deal with this issue of passivity. But then we know another problem in a democratic organization is going to be the creation of conflict. And so we have to manage, we have to deal with conflict in an effective way in order to be an effective organization. Mary Parker Follett argues that there are three basic ways that we can resolve conflicts. The first way is through domination. Through domination, one party wins, one party loses. That's the worst way to deal with conflict because when one party loses, that party is gonna be disaffected. They're not gonna be bought in to the solution because it wasn't their solution to begin with. Uh, they're gonna feel disempowered and they're, they're not gonna to wanna to participate in the organization. So domination is the worst way to deal with conflict. A better way, but still not the most appropriate is what she calls compromise. In compromise, both parties in the conflict give something up. So we negotiate, both parties give something up. Uh, because both parties are giving something up, neither party is gonna be completely satisfied with the way in which that conflict was resolved. The most appropriate way to deal with conflict is what she referred to as integration. In integration, what we can do is through participation, get our employees together, allow our employees to share their thoughts and their opinions. Through this sharing of these thoughts and these opinions, you end up with an interpenetration of ideas where I never really thought of this idea until I started talking to you. And now this is not a bad idea. And so I'm gonna start, the idea is gonna interpenetrate into my way of thinking. And so what we can do is instead of just compromising, we can come up with a new way. We can take all this information, synthesize it, and come up with a new way of answering this problem, dealing with this issue that everyone can then buy into because everyone has a stake in the game. Everyone has participated in the creation of this new novel way of dealing with this issue. It's kind of like this marketplace of ideas that Theodore Lowy talks about in this compound republic 
But we basically have a compound republic in our organizations. We're creating this marketplace of ideas. People can share ideas and then integrate those ideas into a new synthesized answer to a problem. So Follett believes that that's the most effective way of running an organization is to treat it as a democratic type of institution with a lot of employee participation. Now you can see how far afield that is from what we talked about with the classical authors. In the classical school, there was no room there for that type of participation and that type of exchange of ideas, like what Mary Parker Follett talks about with her democratic organizations. But again, the problem is that no one really paid a lot of attention to Follett's writings in the 1920s, even though she was coming up with some ideas that would be similar ideas that her male counterparts 10, 20, and 30 years ago behind her would come up with, but they were coming up with them a decade or two after she did. Uh, there's really very little indication that people like Elton Mayo and some of the human relations theorists knew about these theories that Mary Parker Follett was developing. So Mary Parker Follett oftentimes is referred to as a pre-human relations theorist because she really starts to bridge this gap uh, theoretically between the classical school and the human relations school. But because she was writing in the 1920s before the human relations school really developed, she's oftentimes referred to as a pre-human relations theorist but she is very influential in hindsight because her theories really do start moving us away from that dehumanizing approach that was so prevalent in the classic uh, organization school of thought. So a lot of these ideas of Mary Parker Follett then become essential aspects of the human relations school. And within this human relations school, two of the authors that we talk about here in this class are Chester Barnard and Elton Mayo. We get into 660, we'll talk about more, but right here, we're just gonna talk about Chester Barnard and Elton Mayo, just to kind of whet your appetite for organization theory that will be coming in the future. Chester Barnard. We're gonna deal with Chester Barnard a couple of different times tonight. We're gonna to talk about him here with human relations theory, and then we're also going to talk about him in a few minutes when we talk about the systems school of thought as well, because he contributes to both. But here for human relations approach, Chester Barnard really made us focus on the fact that our individual employees are different from each other. And in order to be an efficient and effective leader or manager, your success is predicated upon your ability to engage in transactions with your employees. So the basic transaction is that a leader or manager will provide incentives to their employees. Those employees, because of those incentives, will then be incentivized to then provide contributions back to the organization. So if you provide the right set of incentives, you'll then get the right contributions from your employees. So an effective and efficient leader or manager is one who can extract the right contributions. And the contributions can be uh, things such as um, putting forth effort, uh, maybe coming in on a weekend to get a job done. Uh, those are the you know, cooperation. Those are the types of contributions that an organization will value. But employees are only gonna give those contributions if they are given the right incentives to incentivize those contributions. So it's very much this transactional relationship between employers and employees. This is important though, because now we are looking at a relationship between employers and employees. Even though it is a transactional relationship, we're still looking at a relationship as opposed to just telling employees do this and expecting them to do those types of tasks. Barnard says that every employee will value different types of incentives differently. So we need to know our individual employees and what they value to give them the right set of incentives to then get the right contributions that we need for the organization to be successful. He also argued that every individual employee had a different, what he referred to as zone of indifference. For Barnard, every employee had their own zone of indifference. And you can think about a zone of indifference in terms of someone's ethical standards, someone's um, norms and values. So if you ask someone to do something, 
that violates their value system, that violates their ethical principles, they're going to push back on that. And they're probably not going to acquiesce and do it. However, if you ask someone to do something that's not going to violate their values and won't violate their ethical principles, then you have a much better chance of them acquiescing and doing it. So what we want to do, according to Barnard, is operate within our individual employees' zones of indifference by not violating their values or their ethical standards. And that's how we have a much better chance of getting contributions from those employees that we need in order to make our organization effective. Well, so what? Well, the big so what here, again, is that we're recognizing that employees are different. They have different zones of indifference, different values and ethical standards. And they also have uh, different ways in which they value incentives that are provided to them by the organization. So our employees are different from each other. A one size fits all approach does not necessarily work for every employee within our organization. You need to get to know your employees and their wants, needs and desires in order to be efficient and effective as a manager. That again, takes us far afield from where we were in the classical school and hence the reason why Chester Barnard is part of what we refer to as the human relations school of thought. Another author within the human relations school of thought is Elton Mayo. If you've had any psychology classes um, in the undergrad level, you may have talked about Elton Mayo before. Mayo really approaches this idea of organization theory from the psychological type of perspective. And so borrows a lot from the world of psychology in developing his theories. If you're familiar with Elton Mayo, you know that Elton Mayo did a lot of different experiments, a lot of different field experiments. The one that we cover in this class, I think is most germane for talking about his theories uh, were the Hawthorne experiments. And in the Hawthorne experiments, Elton Mayo went into the Hawthorne electric plant and decided that he was going to test the relationship between an external stimulus and the productivity of employees. Mayo was very concerned that employees, whenever they enter into the workforce, they bring with them what are referred to as human irrationality. Mayo was concerned that because of the Industrial Revolution, you had a lot of people who were leaving their homes. They used to live in very rural areas, you know, on farms. And they were leaving their homes at a very early age to go and work in the steel mills and to work in industry, oftentimes moving from the rural south up to the Rust Belt to take these industrial jobs. And that's, um, it fits really well with my family history because that's exactly what my father and, and my uncles did. They were on a farm in rural Kentucky. Uh, I, my father left his home when he was, I think, 14 or 15 years old to move to Cleveland, Ohio to work in steel mill. And all of his brothers did the same thing. The concern here with Mayo is that because people were leaving their homes at such an early age, they had a lot of psychological issues with their families that they had not yet resolved. These are issues that you don't really resolve until you're 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. You're not resolving them when you're 14 and 15. And so they're leaving home before they've resolved these types of psychological issues. So his concern is that a lot of our factories were being populated by employees who had what he called human irrationality that they had not yet dealt with because they were too young to go through the maturation process of dealing with those human irrationalities. So what Mayo wanted to do is he wanted to focus on organizations and decide how we could recognize the social aspect of those organizations and then cater to that social aspect to make our organizations more efficient and more effective. So he went into this Hawthorne Electric plant and he said, let's look at what are some of the factors that contribute to or detract from productivity of our employees. So one external stimulus he looked at was the lighting level. So a very simple uh, hypothesis. If we turn up the lighting level, productivity levels will go up because people can see better. Turn the lights up, productivity levels went up. Check on that hypothesis. So well, then my second hypothesis is that if I turn the lighting levels down, productivity levels will go down because people can't see what they're doing as well. They won't be as productive. Turn the lighting levels down, productivity continued to go up. Did it make sense to mail because that external stimulus was not what was affecting productivity? What was affecting productivity 
is that he and his fellow researchers were watching these employees do their job. They were talking with these employees, asking their, these employees, you know, what makes you more productive? What makes you want to work harder? And the mere fact that they were watching these people and talking, interacting with these people made these people more productive. That's what's come to be known in research, as you probably already know, as the Hawthorne effect. When we watch our subjects and our subjects know they are being watched, they're going to behave differently than if they're not being watched. Uh, in a research class I used to teach um, uh, years ago at, at UCLA, we, um, we had one weekly assignment was to watch the live um, feed from Times Square in New York City and to observe the behavior of people as they went about their daily lives uh, in Times Square. And one of the things that a lot of students found is that when people didn't know they were being watched, when they were just kind of there by themselves, they were kind of going about their own business and, kind of, and they weren't paying a whole lot of attention to what they were doing. But once they realized people were watching them around them, then they started behaving differently because they wanted to fit in with social norms and they wanted to be accepted. And so their behavior really was affected by whether or not they felt they were being watched. That's the Hawthorne effect. So what Alton Mayo contributes to our understanding of organizations is a recognition of the social aspect of those organizations. We have to realize that organizations are social entities and that people need um, self-esteem. People need to feel that they belong. And we need to cater to those feelings in order to make our organizations effective. We cannot forget the social aspect of our organizations like the classical theorists forgot about or never really even considered. And secondly, he recognized that there were groups that formed within organizations and groups could have a major impact upon the productivity of employees within those organizations. What he found is that if you would put employees into a group and if one member of that group was not pulling their weight, they were not being productive, they were making the rest of the group look bad, all the other members of the group would start putting pressure on that member in order for that person to work harder and be more productive so the rest of the group doesn't look so bad. So we have to recognize that you have group pressure in these social atmospheres, and these social environments that we need to take into account as well. Essentially, Mayo tells us organizations are social in nature, and we can't just look at the organizational chart or the components of the job that are being done or the tools that managers need to have. We need to recognize the social aspect of our organizations. Again, feeding into this whole idea of the human relations approach valuing individual employees, getting to know our individual employees, and recognizing how our interaction with those employees will have a direct impact upon their productivity. So it is a, I hate to use the term warm and fuzzier, but it is a warmer and fuzzier approach to how we measure organizations than what we see saw with the classical counterparts. However, at the end of the day, the ultimate goal of treating these employees as human beings and uh, recognizing that they have differences between each other and recognizing that they respond to uh, interaction from leaders and managers, the whole goal of that is not necessarily to develop the individual employee as a human resource. The goal is still the organization. We're basically using these employees as a means to an end, that we can get more contributions from them, so therefore, that will then make our organization more productive and our organization more effective and more efficient. So the ultimate goal in human relations theory is still the organization, the goals and objectives of the organization. It is still that macro level goal. We will use micro level strategies in order to achieve those macro level goals, but we're still looking at the ultimate goal being the organization's effectiveness and efficiency. But with human relations theory, human relations school of thought, we are now at least recognizing that our individual employees are human beings. They have their own sets of wants, needs, and desires. And we need to recognize that as leaders and as managers. So we saw the human relations school of thought really start to gain prominence through the 30s, the 40s, and into the 1950s. But again, with human relations theory, we are still focusing on the goal being the goal of the organization. And that we're just essentially manipulating employees to get them to be more productive, to achieve the goals of the organization. 
Another neoclassical school of thought is what's known as human resource management school. And here with the human resource management school in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and carrying on into the 1980s, what we are doing is we are now not only looking at the goals of the organization, but we're beginning to look at the goals of individual employees as well. And the three main authors we typically talk about in human resource management school of thought, Abraham Maslow, Douglas McGregor, and Chris Argyris. Abraham Maslow, I'm sure you've run into before in your undergraduate courses, especially in psychology. Abraham Maslow brings in a psychological approach to studying the wants, needs, and desires of individual human beings. Maslow, as you probably know, came up <clears throat> with this idea of a hierarchy of needs as represented there on the screen for you, this pyramidal hierarchy of needs that employees have these five levels of needs. They have physiological needs. And so everyone needs to have food, everyone needs to have clothing, everyone needs to have shelter. Those are your basic physiological needs. Everyone that has safety needs, everyone has the need to feel safe from harm. Everyone has belonging needs and that we all have the need to belong to something bigger than ourselves, to belong to a group, to belong to a family, to belong to an organization. The next higher level, you then have what he calls esteem needs, the need to be um, to hold yourself in high esteem and to have others hold you in high esteem and respect you as well. And at the very top, the apex of the hierarchy of needs is self-actualization. Self-actualization is probably best characterized as being all that you can be, achieving your utmost ultimate potential. So as the army used to say, be all you can be, join the army. Well, this is be all you can be as a human being. The bottom four needs are what are referred to as your deficiency needs. People are motivated by deficiencies in these needs. So for your physiological needs, you're motivated if you don't have enough food to eat, you are motivated to get enough food to eat. That will motivate you to be more productive and to work harder. If you don't feel that you are safe from harm, you're going to be motivated to try and secure safety for yourself. If you don't feel that you belong to a group, you're going to be motivated by trying to appeal to others to belong to something bigger than yourself. But those four bottom ones are what are referred to as deficiency needs. People are motivated by deficiencies in those needs. Self-actualization at the top of our pyramid, that's what's referred to as a growth need, a being need or a growth need. We are not motivated by a deficiency in this need. We are motivated by the need to continue growing, to continue becoming all that we can be, to be, continue self-actualizing. So this is an ongoing need. It's not going to go away once the deficiency has been filled. It's going to continue to motivate people throughout their entire lives. For the bottom four deficiency needs, once the deficiency is filled, it no longer serves as a motivator. The self-actualization, it continues to motivate. So if you can appeal to the self-actualization needs of your employees, you can better motivate them to be more productive because you're helping them find a way to become what they want to become as a human being. It's not all about the organization. It's now about helping that employee develop as a human resource, helping them self-actualize and become all that they can be. Now, it is important to note that very late in his life, Abraham Maslow made some modifications to his hierarchy of needs. And most classes don't talk about those late in life modifications. But one of the major modifications he made was to that apex, that self-actualization. Later in life, Maslow argued that that growth need is about more than just trying to be all you can be as an individual. And really, people are also motivated by what they can give back to those around them, that people want to leave a legacy. They want to leave a legacy in their family and in their community. And so your ability to contribute to those around you and contribute to your community, that's kind of how he refashioned this growth need. So it goes beyond just growing as an individual. It goes toward how you can help your community and those around you grow. Now, it's kind of a modification he made at the very end of his career. So Abraham Maslow brings in this psychological approach of people have different sets of needs. 
So we need to know our individual employees, know where they are in terms of their deficiency needs and their growth needs, and then that will help us develop these individual employees as human resources. The big difference between human resource management school and the human relations school is that in the human relations school, we were looking at manipulating our employees in order to get the most productivity out of them that we could to meet the goals of the organization. In human resource management school, we are looking to try and help those people develop as human resources. And helping them develop is just as important as achieving the goals of the organization. So even if you help someone develop as a human resource and you provide them with skills and training and help them develop so that they can become all that they can be and they then leave the organization, as a result of all the training and the development they've received, that's okay in human resource management theory because you have helped them develop as human beings. Douglas McGregor, who is a big believer in the theories of Abraham Maslow, used Maslow's theories to develop what he called his theory X and his theory Y, two very famous theories in public management. For McGregor, theory X and theory Y were diametrically opposed. So in theory X, McGregor argued that in theory X, you have a very negative view of employees, much like what Frederick Taylor had back in scientific management. If you view your employees under theory X, you're viewing them as being lazy, you're viewing them as being not very intelligent, as being not very creative, as not wanting to work and having to be motivated to work there's a very negative view of employees as human beings. Theory Y was the exact opposite. So whereas Theory X said people were lazy and, uh, and not intelligent, Theory Y says that they are motivated, they are very intelligent, they are very creative, they aspire to uh, what we call superordinate positions, they aspire to higher level positions, they want to accept more responsibility. It's a much kinder and gentler view of individual employees. Well, so what? The so what question we'd like to answer is that what we are doing is we have classical theory X organizations, but the majority of our employees, according to McGregor, are theory Y employees. So we are shoehorning theory Y employees into theory X organizations. And when we do that, it has a disincentive type of a feeling for those employees. It's hard to motivate those employees when they're in a theory X organization. So what McGregor argues is that it's not just about what the individual employee can give to the organization, it's about what the organization can do for the development of the individual employee. Can I take the old JFK, you know, ask not what we can do for your nation, but uh, you know, it's not what your nation can do for you, but what can you do for your nation? It's that kind of turning that around and saying, you know, ask not what the individual can do for the organization, ask what the organization can also then do for the individual. So McGregor says we need to change up our organizations, our structures and our processes to make our organizations more theory Y in nature. And an example of how you can make your organization more theory Y in nature, he gives us in terms of what he calls job enrichment. So everyone has their position description. Everyone has the tasks that they do on a daily basis. If you can allow your employees to fashion their own tasks and to enrich their jobs by finding additional functions, and additional responsibilities that will help them grow into the type of person they want to be, that's what's called job enrichment. Job enrichment is a lot different than job enlargement. And job enlargement is just simply increasing the tasks and the requirements of the job. If you just increase the tasks and the requirements of the jobs without consultation and participation on the part of the employees, Obviously, that's not going to be very really good for their motivation. It's not going to help them develop as, as human resources. So you ask them, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? And let me help you get there. And I can help you get there by providing training opportunities, uh, cross-functional training, 
where you can learn how to do other jobs in the organization and enhance the skill set you want to enhance in order to ultimately get where you want to get as not only an employee, but also as an individual. In the leadership motivation theories, that's what's known as a path goal approach. And I think we may have mentioned it before in this course, but a path goal approach where you work with your employees to help establish what their goals are as human beings. And then as a manager, your job is to clear the path, show them the path and clear the obstacles from the path so they can achieve those goals. So again, it becomes much more about the individual employee as opposed to just about the goals of the organization. Chris Argyris was a student of Douglas McGregor and he took McGregor's approach to theory Y and he expanded it with what, with what was known as his personal growth theory. And in Argyris's personal growth theory, he argues that as people age, they go through this maturation process. And in this maturation process, it's a process of personal growth, whereby people, as they go through this maturation process, they start being more concerned about the long term as compared to only the short term. They aspire to superordinate positions. They aspire to higher level positions in the organization. They want to take on more responsibility and want to take on more accountability. Uh, they become more interested in giving back to their community as opposed to just personal growth as an employee in terms of you know, moving up the corporate ladder. They really start taking on this more um, holistic type of approach to their orientation as they go through this personal growth process. According to Ardress, it's the job of the organization to help their employees on their path on their way through this personal growth journey. So you can see certainly how in human resource management theory, we are different than human relations theory in that we are actually helping people develop as human resources for the purpose of helping them develop as individuals, irrespective sometimes of what they're able to give back to the organization in the long term. So we're developing people as human resources and that is just as important as achieving our goals as an organization under human resource management theory. So it kind of gets rid of that exploitation aspect of the human relations approach and really focuses on what individual employees need in order to, to grow as human beings. Again, this human resource management theory, uh, this school of thought, uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s, and the 80s, and still at play today in a lot of our modern organizations. Whenever we see things like employee assistance programs, we see targeted training and professional development programs, people participating in the creation of their own position descriptions and performance evaluation processes. Those are all part of this human resource management type of a school of thought. So again, it's a much more... Um, employee-friendly approach with human resource management school as compared to human relations school, and certainly as compared to uh, the classical school of organization theory. So as we have moved through this evolution of organization theory, our theories have begun to focus more on the benefits for our individual employees, as opposed to just a myopic focus on the effectiveness and the efficiency of the organization itself. And I know we're starting to get a little long in the tooth here for the first half of the class. It's 7.23, according to my computer. So 7.24, just switched over. So let's go ahead and take a, a brief break here. I uh, kind of digest some of this information in our progress throughout the history of the development of organization theory. Let's say, let's take about a... Um, if you can, about a 10-minute break, if that's okay with everybody, we'll say come back at 7.35. We come back at 7.35, we'll continue our evolution of the organization theory literature, and we'll move into what we consider to be the system school of thought. Then we'll go into more modern approaches and focus primarily on organization culture, in the school of organization culture. And then we'll see where we are sitting time-wise, if time permits. Uh, then we'll move into a breakout group exercise looking specifically at organization culture theory. 
So take about a 10 minute break, come back at 7.35 and we'll jump into systems theory and systems school of thought. Professor, can I ask a question? Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, I had a question. So for the midterm, I was working on it and I think it's the question on the neoclassical. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. I had selected based on the reading, so I don't know if I have to redo it or just add to it. The first theory I looked at was the humanist theory. Mm -hmm. um, but now that I have more information, I think I'll add something to it. And then the second thing that or theory that I focused on or approach was the plurist. Mm -hmm. Is that appropriate? Sure. Or you're looking for something more specific? No, I, th that's fine. Uh, you know, again, I, I like to present a little bit different way than what Don presents in the textbook. You know, the pluralist approach is a very much akin to this idea of, you know, democratic organizations and more participation on the part of employees. You know, that's kind of this idea of pluralism. So I think it's fine if you want to look at humanist and pluralist. I think both of those fit well within the neoclassical approach. So you can stay with those if you would like. Um, again, I just the way in which I approach it, I want to give you some, some different perspectives beyond just what Don mm -hmm. Kettle does in the textbook. But I think humanistic approach, pluralistic approach, those both fit nicely within neoclassical. Okay, and my second question was, you went into like the differences between humanist schools. Um, should I differentiate which one I'm talking about or I can just focus like generally on both as long as it's clear in the writing? Yeah, I think you can focus generally on both. I just, I really like to differentiate between this idea of human relations and human resource management, just because of the purposes of, of, of the two approaches. And that with human relations, the purpose is still focusing on the organization. In human resource management, it's more focusing on the individual employee and their welfare and their development. And so I, I kind of like to distinguish between those two. Um, but I think if you want to focus on, you know, humanistic and pluralistic, I think that's fine as well. And just focus on those two more generally because they, again, fit really well in the neoclassical type of school. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, let's go ahead and take a break. And I will, um, we'll be back at about 7.35 and then we'll, we'll turn our attention to systems theory and talk about looking outside the organization, not just internally to the walls of the organization. So we'll do that when we come back at 7.35. Okay, it's 7.35, so we are back. Um, let's continue our discussion of the evolution of theoretical perspectives in public administration, specifically looking at theoretical perspectives on public organizations with a uh, movement into another school of thought, which is referred to as systems theory. Systems theory is different than what we have covered up to this point in time because with systems theory, we're kind of we're looking at the, the balance between different parts of a system. That instead of just looking at the organization as one entity, now we're starting to look at the organization and the environment in which that organization resides. There are essentially two different views when it comes to the system school of thought. There's what's known as closed or natural systems theory. And then there's what's known as open systems theory. Closed or natural systems theory, and this is something Chester Barnard contributed to as well. But in closed or natural systems theory, we are really borrowing a lot of our ideas from, from the natural sciences. And we view our organizations in natural systems theory as essentially being akin to a living organism. And so we know if we think about an organization like, like the human body, the human body operates best whenever everything is in balance. And so when your blood pressure is normal, when your, your pulse ox is normal, when you are devoid of diseases, you have a normal pulse rate, that's when you are in balance as, as a human being. That point of being in balance is the goal of a human being because the human being's goal is survival. And the more that you can balance all the functions within your system, within the human body, the better your odds are at surviving in the future. So that balance point that all living organisms are striving for is that point known as homeostasis. And again, this is a concept that comes to us from the natural sciences, the idea of homeostasis. 
homeostasis is that balance where if the organization, all the different parts of the organization are all in balance with each other, then that organization has achieved its point of homeostasis, it's achieved organizational harmony, and that's how organizations survive for a longer period of time. The problem with viewing an organization as a living organism that is seeking out its point of homeostasis is that all living organisms begin to decay. And I don't want to depress you too much on a Monday night. It's a Monday after all. But all organisms from the time that they are born, they begin decaying. And there's the eventual death process that they will go through. As they age, they dissipate energy out into their environment. They lose resources and lose energy. That process of dissipating energy out into the environment is what's known as the process of entropy. So all living organisms go through this entropy process and all organizations, according to natural systems theorists, will go through that entropy process as well, where they will dissipate energy resources out into their environment. So some examples from an organizational perspective of some of the resources that can be dissipated into the environment. If you have high rates of turnover, you have a brain drain, as they call it in your organization, where you have very competent, very skilled employees that are leaving the organization to go to other organizations or to work in other sectors, uh, that's an entropy process. If you lose appropriations from one year to the next and your budget's getting smaller, that's another example of an entropy process. Uh, if you lose political support among elected officials, though, or you lose support among citizens and your client groups, your constituents, that's another example of entropy. So the natural systems theorists look at organizations striving to achieve this balance homeostasis in order to survive as long as they can but recognizing that all organizations go through this entropy process. And eventually, once they dissipate too many resources into the environment, they will no longer have the requisite resources in order to survive as an organization. And that's when these organizations then die. That's when these organizations then go out of existence. So that's this natural system type of approach. There is a gentleman who we will talk about when we get to 660 much more in depth by the name of Robert Merton. And Robert Merton questioned this whole idea of the analogy of an organization as a living organism. And he argued that if we are going to assume that organizations are living organisms, then we would assume that everything that they do, all the behaviors they engage in, will be geared toward enhancing the prospects of their survival into the future. Just like living organisms try and live as long as they can live, organizations will try and live as long as they can live as well. Burton says there's a problem with that assumption in that organizations will sometimes engage in behaviors that are not geared toward their survival. Sometimes organizations will make very risky types of moves that they feel are in the best interest of good policy that may not curry favor with elected officials and may actually end up um, removing their appropriations and going out of existence. An example of that is back in the mid 1990s, one of my favorite organizations I did a lot of work with was called the United States Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations or the ACIR. The ACIR was around for many, many years. I think it was founded in like 1959. And in the mid-1990s, it produced a report, a draft report, that the commissioners had not approved, but it was a draft report that called upon Congress to make major substantial changes to a lot of their policies that they had adopted over the past 30 or 40 years. Now, that was a very bold move for the ACAR to make, because obviously members of Congress are not going to be very pleased with the, um, the recommendation that Congress has aired and that Congress um, should back off on some of its control of some of these policies. Congress was so angry at these recommendations that it ended up taking the budget away from the US uh, ACAR. It defunded, they zeroed them out as we called in budgeting, took the budget away from ACIR. ACIR then had to close up shop and go out of business in 1996. 
That's an example of taking an action, engaging in a behavior because it was supported by empirical evidence, it was supported by research that did not help the organization survive. In fact, it actually led to its immediate uh, demise uh, in the fiscal year 1996 budget. So Merton says there are examples of that all over the place where organizations, every behavior they engage in is not necessarily designed for furthering agency survival. So once he starts to question this idea of organizations as living organisms, it helps us kind of move away from natural systems theory and helps us move more toward what's referred to as open systems theory. And open systems theory is most closely associated with two authors by the name of Katz and Kahn, and they are both in the classics text, and we will cover them again once we get to um, our discussion of organization theory in our 660 course. And Katz and Kahn in open systems theory start to argue that homeostasis looks different than it did in the closed or natural systems theory. It's not just finding this balance within the organization, but homeostasis now involves finding a balance between the organization and its external environment. So the balance is between the organization and its external environment. And organizations don't always go through an entropy process. There's an alternative to entropy that is known as negative entropy. As you see there on the screen, negative entropy is when organizations not only dissipate energy out into their environment, but they also pull and import new energies into the organization that helps the organization survive. We've got some organizations that have been around for a very long period of time. Think about something like the Department of State. Department of State's been around for two, over 200 years. A lot of our organizations don't go out of existence because they're very good at engaging at negative entropy. They can balance the resources that they lose with bringing new resources in. So new resources like a, a well-educated and a well-prepared labor pool and bringing those new employees into the organization, uh, finding grants and bringing grant money into the organization, appealing to elected officials to enhance and augment the appropriations for the next fiscal year, um, getting political support among policymakers and elected officials, building support among the, uh, the citizens and among the public that what you are doing as an organization is certainly worthwhile and worthy of supporting. Those are all new energies that can be brought into the organization through negative entropy that keeps those organizations from going out of existence. But the interesting thing about systems theory, whether it's natural systems theory or open systems theory, is it really views organizations as part of something bigger, as, as part of this something bigger, this environment that is bigger than the organization, systems do not have a tangible permanent existence. Systems can change over time. They're very dynamic. Environments can change. New administrations can come into office. Uh, the uh, needs of your citizens can change over time. Economic conditions can have a big impact upon the resources that your organization has. These environments are very dynamic and will have an impact upon the organization. Organizations are affected by their environments and organizations can also in turn have an impact upon their environments as well. It's an important notion because especially with open systems theory, we're now not just studying the organization, we're now studying the role the organization plays in its larger environment. We really start to recognize in systems theory a lot of the major differences between a public organizational environment as compared to a private organizational environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the organization, the environments are much different for public as compared to private organizations. I like systems theory a lot because I think all of our organizations operate within somewhat of an open system. If you're a public organization, you've got a lot of external influences that will have an impact upon what you do and how you do it as an organization. So if we want to explain the behaviors of our organization, because at the end of the day, that's what we are trying to do with our theories. We're developing theories to understand why organizations do what they do and why they behave in the way in which they behave. We have to understand the environment that surrounds those organizations as well. 
And so I think most of our organizational analysis today takes into account open systems theory and the environment that surrounds our organization. So it's a much more holistic way of studying our organizations. Systems theory again starts to be really hit its heyday in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. And still today, we do a lot of systems theory in terms of understanding our organizations and our approach to understanding why our organizations do what they do. In the 660 class, we will get into a discussion of a variety of different, more modern organization theories. For our purposes here in this class, we're going to pull one of those modern theories out to discuss, and we'll pull my favorite modern theory out to discuss, and that's the theory of organization culture. Organization culture, I think, really epitomizes where we are today compared to where we were back in the early 1900s in the way in which we view our organizations. In the early 1900s, in the classical approach, we were looking for the one-size-fits-all approach that applies to all organizations. Today, we recognize that every organization is different, and every organization has its own unique organization culture. Remember back to when we talked about accountability and ethics. We talked about the modern approach to ensuring accountability and ethics is recognizing that every organization has its own culture and then tailoring our accountability measures to those unique organization cultures. So with organization culture, we are viewing each organization as having its own different unique culture, which then obviously raises the question of what is culture? When we talk about something having a culture, what do we mean by a culture? By culture, we're oftentimes talking about the values and the norms and the expectations for behavior that are shared by members of a society or shared by members of an organization. Every country has its own unique political culture. Every organization has its own unique organization culture, its own set of norms, values, beliefs, and expectations for behavior. Now, in organization culture, we can study organizations in a similar way that we would study an ancient society. And so we're borrowing from anthropology, we're borrowing from archaeology in learning how to study our organizations. So if you want to study an ancient society, you go out on an archaeological dig. In that archaeological dig, you will dig up some artifacts, and those artifacts will show you how that ancient society lived and what that ancient society valued. So you dig up an artifact such as uh, an eating utensil, uh, such as a bowl, and that can then give you some insight in terms of what they ate, how they ate, and how that affected their, their daily lives. You might dig up some artifacts such as you know, hieroglyphics or some, some drawings and some paintings that can give you some insight into the daily life of that organization. So just like ancient societies produce artifacts that we can study, organizations also produce artifacts that we can study as well. Artifacts of organizations are things such as their agendas for their meetings, uh, minutes that are derived from those meetings as well are artifacts. Policy and procedure manuals can be artifacts of that organization because it really shows you how that organization functioned on a daily basis. Those things are very transparent. They're very tangible. Those artifacts are relatively easy to acquire in studying an organization. That's the most superficial level of organization culture. But then there's a deeper level of organization culture, such as what we call espoused values. The espoused values of the organization are things such as the organization's vision statement. Here is the vision of where we want to be in the future as an organization and where we feel that we fit within our organizational environment. It can be your mission statement. This is who we are as an organization and what we, we really value as an organization. Your goals and your objectives in your strategic plan. Those are your espoused values, what you value as an organization. And you are telling society, you're telling everyone around you, this is what we are valuing as an organization. So again, that's all relatively easy to acquire, may not be as, um, uh, as ubiquitous as agenda, agendas and meeting minutes, but it's still something that's relatively tangible that we can study. 
at the more hidden level of organization culture, or what we refer to as the basic assumptions of that organization. Basic assumptions are oftentimes unspoken. They're not necessarily written down. They're just assumptions that everyone shares about how we do our daily business, what we value as an organization, and our ex expectations for how individuals will behave within the organization and how the organization will behave in terms of its constituency in the external environment. So one of our basic assumptions may be that we treat everyone with respect. You know, we may not say that out loud. We may not you know, write that down, but it's something that we all share uh, an assumption of as, as members of the organization, that everyone's gonna get, gonna get treated with respect, that we respect everyone in the organization. That's a basic assumption of the organization. That's a very important basic assumption, but it's more difficult for us to study because it's oftentimes unspoken. It's just something that everyone assumes uh, in terms of their interactions with each other. So we can study artifacts, we can study espoused values, we can study basic assumptions, three different ways in which we can study the culture of that organization. Leaders oftentimes will embed new cultures into their organizations when they arrive in those organizations. And there are different ways in which leaders can embed their culture into the organization. You can have primary embedding mechanisms, secondary embedding mechanisms. Uh, an example is when I was on the board of the school district, we hired a new superintendent from outside of the school district, which is relatively unusual. In the past, the district always hired superintendents and assistant superintendents basically from, from within. We went outside and we hired an outside superintendent. That superintendent came in and not really knowing that she was embedding culture, did a lot of the primary embedding mechanisms for embedding culture. One of the things that she did is she came up with a new slogan, uh, together we achieve more. That was placed on all stationery, all letterhead, on everything that was produced by the district. That tagline of together we achieve more and the little graphic that went along with it, that was involved in every single piece of correspondence. Uh, both inside as well as going outside the organization. That type of a slogan is a primary embedding mechanism. Uh, some other embedding mechanisms, what leaders pay attention to, what leaders value, what they reward, that's an embedding mechanism for what the organization values. And so if an employee behaves in a certain way and then gets some type of reward for it, other employees say, well, that's something that the organization values, and so that's something I should uh, try and engage in. Again, I like organization culture and pull it out as one of our modern theories to talk about in this class because it really does underscore how far we have come in the development of our theoretical approaches to how we understand public organizations. Today, it's a much more contextual, situational type of approach. A lot of the more modern leadership theories that you'll discuss, again, in your organization theory course, really focus on those types of um, situational approaches to how we lead. We lead according to situation, we lead according to the context of the, the situation we're dealing with. At some points in time, we are a more transactional leader. At other points in time, we're gonna be a more transformational leader. How we lead will depend upon the employee that we are leading at that particular point in time and the, the, the context of the situation that we are dealing with. So if you wanna characterize this development of the theoretical approaches to understanding public organizations, it really has been a very long and gradual process of moving away from the search for the one size fits all approach and recognizing that uh, the way in which we study organizations will depend upon the specific context of those individual organizations. How uh, you would study the Department of Agriculture, that is a massive department that has regional and field offices spread all over the country, it's going to be a lot different than how you study the uh, Marine Conservation Commission, which is a commission made up of 12, I believe it's 12 marine biologists. That's a much different organization than the Department of Agriculture. So how you study your organization will depend upon the unique characteristics and culture of those organizations. The implication of that is that it makes it more difficult for us to study public organizations today. Back in the classical school, we had a one size fits all approach. It was very simple. We dealt with all organizations as the same. Today, we know we can't do that. So it's a much more complex, complicated 
approach to studying our public organizations. But to put this within the context of public administration as a discipline, through our discussion of the different schools, the thought, the development of the theoretical approaches to studying public organizations, we have seen that there are some organic theories that have developed primarily within public administration. You know, Luther Gullick and the principal school, the Paz Corp school, uh, kind of grew out of uh, the study of public organizations themselves. But we also have borrowed very heavily from other disciplines. Weber came from sociology. Taylor came from the world of business. Mayo and Maslow come from the world of, of psychology. Um, uh, you know, Sheen comes from more of an anthropological and archaeological type of approach. There's a very famous theory in public administration known as field theory that actually comes from the world of, of quantum physics and quantum mechanics. So we borrow very heavily from a lot of other disciplines, modify those theories to make them fit our study of public organizations. So whereas we have some homegrown theories, most of our theories are borrowed from other disciplines, making public administration a very interdisciplinary type of field of study. And I think that's all then food for thought in terms of your consideration of whether or not you believe public administration is a discipline. And that's something you'll be talking about then in Canvas essay number four, and also something that you'll be talking about on one of the scenarios on the final assessment as well. So again, that kind of covers our tour de force through the development of the organization theory literature beginning in the late uh, 1800s and moving through to the modern period of time, kind of foreshadows a lot of the things we'll cover when we get into our 660 organization theory course. We'll just put a lot more flesh on the bones in 660. We'll talk about a lot of additional theorists in each one of those schools of thought and uh, some of the nuances between the different theorists in each one of our different schools. But kind of gives you a little foreshadowing of what you'll end up getting in 660 organization theory. Um, any basic questions about any of this information we have covered up to this point in time? I see it's about eight o'clock. So any questions at all on any of this information? You now have all the information you need then to do your midterm assessment. And so this information will then apply directly to scenario number five in your discussion of you know, selecting two of your classical uh, theorists and two neoclassical theorists to apply to that number five scenario. So any questions about any of this information up to now? Okay. If not, then um, I did have a breakout group assignment for us to do, but it looks at organization culture, but I'm almost inclined now to just kind of call the night at this point and then give you the remaining time that you can then work on your midterm assessment because again, you've got that coming due on the 26th. Also, I hate to make the final assessment available before you turn in your midterm assessment. I kind of hate to do that to you. So what I will do is I will make the final assessment available uh, beginning next Monday, the first day of our spring break. You don't have to look at it over spring break. It's completely up to you. But if you don't have plans over spring break, you wanna start looking at the final assessment, I'll make it available on the 27th. And it's up to you whether or not you wanna look at over spring break. Then we get together on April 3rd at the beginning of class, we'll start that class at seven o'clock. And I will go through very briefly the final assessment, go through all the scenarios like we did with the midterm assessment, to make sure that everyone is up to speed on what you're gonna be doing. And then the final assessment will then be due by April 15th. That's provided that we get through all of our information by the end of class on April 10th. If we have not gotten through all of our information, we still have our managing financial resources information to cover on Saturday the 15th, then I will push the due date for the final assessment back. And I will give you that entire weekend then to finish up that one scenario on financial management and then have, probably have the final exam then due by 17th or 18th. But we'll jump off that bridge when we come to it. But as of right now, I'll have the final assessment ready for you to take a look at by Monday the 27th, and then we'll talk about it at the beginning of class on April the 3rd. But rather than going through the breakout groups, I thought I would just stop it here, give you the extra time tonight to then finish up working on your midterm assessment that is then due along with Canvas essay number three, 
by midnight on Sunday, March 26th. That sound good? Okay. Um, if there are no other questions or no other concerns about the information, I'll make this uh, video available no later than tomorrow morning that you can go back and review the information if you need to. Again, you got those two assignments that are then due on the 26th. I wish everyone a very um, happy and healthy spring break. So please do enjoy it. And then we'll start our April 3rd class up at 7 p.m. and uh, cover policy analysis. We'll cover program evaluation. So your 670 and your 696 courses talk about effectiveness in organizations. And then we will move on into a uh, discussion of managing human resources then on the 10th and then wrap it up with matching financial resources. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Powell. Uh, could you remind me where we can watch the lectures that are recorded? Is that yeah. available on Canvas? Yeah, it's on the Canvas site. And so if you go under the modules, it scroll down on the modules all the way to the bottom. And then I have a module there with all the links for the, the recording. So it's at the very bottom of the page. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, and have a good week. I look forward to reading your midterm assessment and the remaining Canvas essays. And otherwise, then have a great spring break and we'll be back at it again at seven o'clock on Monday, April the 3rd. So thanks a lot. Have a great break, everyone. Take care. Thank you.